Hey everyone, it's Robert Earl out here at the Eco Ranch in Far West Texas, sitting in my chair for a minute, looking like I fell in a cement mixer. Well, I'm sorry guys, I work with cement. Why wouldn't I look like I fell in a cement mixer if I'm working with cement? But today we're not working with cement. This is number two, this is so far the hottest week of the year. We're running about 103, 104 in the afternoons and it just isn't worth it. But what we are going to do is we are going to make prickly pear juice. Aha! There's a lot you can eat out here in the desert. And prickly pears are just one of them. I'm going to show you some of the varieties of prickly pear I have here. Then we're going to make prickly pear juice. So hang we on a second. out here in our um, prickly pear garden. It's a garden that Debbie and I are cultivating to grow prickly pears so that we have um, the fruits to harvest um, on our own. Um, when we first bought our place, there were uh, ancient, ancient prickly pears. Now this is a true prickly pear, what you'd call a true prickly pear. You can tell by the shape of the fruit and they're just about ripe. Um, but there were these ancient ones that were literally 10 and 12 feet tall at the entryway coming into our place here. Well, the first year we moved in, uh, they were wonderful. The next year we had a drought and the rabbits, if you look down here, you see how this whole little, this is a young prickly pear, but you can see how it's supported by just that one root there, or that one paddle, I should say, that's in the ground. The rabbits or the javelinas or the donkeys or maybe all three, I blame the rabbits because I don't like rabbits. They got in there on those ancient ones that were still supported by one, not all the way through the base, knocked them over and killed them. So almost all of these babies out here in my garden, there's a look at it, came off of those dying uh, plants. They were, I, I waited till I was sure they were gonna die and then I harvested them. So these are true prickly pears, mostly. This is in a Joshua tree, you can't eat those. Then I got some spineless prickly pears. And the spineless ones, they mature a little later, so these, these fruits won't be ready for a long, long time. Um, then you have the, um, I don't know what to call them. I just call them not prickly pears. These are the not prickly pears, and you can see they're long and slender. There is a lot of good tasting juice in these, but this juice is green. So I do harvest these, but I, I really don't. Um, you can see I've let some fall off. Debbie's gonna get out and harvest them right now. So what's that, three? Three varieties. Then there's this one. I think I'll open it in this video here. I'll open one in this video. This came from Arizona and they call it a desert fig. It's a variety of a prickly pear, or a paddle cactus at least. And I have uh, uh, three plants. This one got, oh, what, what, are, what it looked like about 15 fruits there. Two fruits on this one and none on this one. They're all desert fig and they should get really big. So that's, that's the plant. And the fruit juice is absolutely delicious. You can drink it straight, you can mix it with stuff. Of course, like any, any liquid that you mix with alcohol, it tastes really good, and, and that's pretty much what we do with it. So let me show you. It's kind of cool how we, um, how we juice them, and I'll show you the juicing process. Hey, why don't we do this before, um, before I show you the juicing process. I took one of the desert figs just now, and I'm glad I did because it appears to be a ripe fruit even though it's not red. So that's a, um, that's kind of a plus. You'll notice I'm holding the fruit with a, um, uh, with a pair of tongs and the reason for that is they're loaded with little protective spines and uh, they get in and they irritate the hell out of you. My hands are loaded with them now even though I've been using the tongs and staying away from it. We finished cutting this open and I'll uh, show you. Okay, I've cut the desert fig open, and that's what the interior of it looks like. I've got a, you can see I've got a spoon in my hand. Let's just give it a taste and see what it's like. Um, now I have a mouthful of seeds, and that happens, I'm going to spit them out. Pardon me. Um, you know what it tasted like? It tasted a lot like natural applesauce. If you if you um, you know make applesauce without um, um, without sugar, that's what it tasted like. I gotta tell you, it's really good. I'm gonna save that other the other half of this one and I'll eat it in a little bit. 
but um, quite tasty. So that's the desert fig. I'm, I'm glad we did that, and I'm glad I did it on camera, and you all, you all got to see that. So let me eat this one, and we'll move on. Mmm. You want one, chicken? Look. You can't see it, but the chicken's eating it. Well, we've been having a field day today. Um, like I said, I set today aside. I didn't want to do any work out there. So I've got a bunch of meat to cut up, and I've got all these to do. So we set this day aside for prickly pear and other work. The uh, desert fig is down there, and that chicken is just having a field day with it. Now, if you know anything about prickly pears, one of the complaints people have with it is when you try to get juice out of a prickly pear, watch this. You get slime. It's snotty looking, and it actually, and, and, and don't tell me you don't know what it feels like. It actually feels like snot in your mouth. And it's gross. It's sweet and it's wonderful. And if Andrew Zimmer were here, he'd have, let's see, I think, no, he doesn't like slimy stuff. But anyway, he'd drink it anyway. Um, this will not go to waste. I just wanted to show you. Look at that. As Marvin Zindler in Houston used to say, there's slime in the prickly pears. I think it was in the ice machine, but... Okay, I'll have a drink with that later. I'll put it in the refrigerator now. But I wanted to show you what you typically get. Then I'll show you what I get and the way I get it. And there's going to be a hundred comments and emails that are going to come to me from people that have a different way and a better way. I understand. Send them if you want. I'll read them all. I'll post them. But we've all got to have our own way of doing stuff. This is the way I've developed to do it. I think you'll, um, uh, I think you'll have fun watching. Okay, I think you can see my workstation. You don't have to see me. Um, with what we're going to do here is I'll show you how I cut them up and that. And I think here's what I'm going to do with the other half of the um, of the um, desert fig. Uh, I'm just going to put it in here. Now, what is in there? Well, all right. Now I'm holding in my hand a bucket that weighs about 40 pounds, 45 pounds. Yeah, I strain it that kind of weight, guys. Completely full of prickly pear fruit. Prickly pear fruit. If I don't say this, I'm going to get the comments. For some reason, somehow, it may be that that's a Spanish name for the fruits, but they aren't prickly pear fruit. They call them tunas. Uh, yeah, tuna is something completely different. This is a fruit. So Anyway, the correct word for it is that. I don't like it, so I'm not going to use it. Now, that slime that I had, as near as Debbie and I can figure, it comes from, if you macerate the skin. Uh, and what I did with that bunch we had there is I thought, well, I'll chop it up in the blender, then I'll strain it through my press. Well, the slime came through. So I believe the slime is all contained in the skin. So what you don't want to do is chop that skin up. But what you do want to do is two or three little cuts. This knife that I'm using is a um, one of the Ginsu knife sets. Remember those Ginsu knives that were so popular years ago, nobody buys them now? They're still a good knife. Uh, and it cuts it real nicely. So I pick up the fruit, hold it with the tongs. You can cut it in half, two, threes, fours, just hack it a little bit, but you don't want to chop that skin up. So you notice that I'm taking them and I am um, cutting them up, putting them in a pot, and the pot's got a shroud on it. Well, that's cheesecloth. If you don't have cheesecloth, which every kitchen should have cheesecloth, which brings me to something else, too. Hello. Brings me to something else. I'm starting a new YouTube channel. Uh, cooking has been my passion my whole life, and I've got this, when it's cleaned up and organized, I've got this really nice outdoor kitchen here set up where I can have guests sit and where I could actually film. So I'm starting a new YouTube channel. It's called The Desert Chef, and I'm going to put in parentheses in there. Not cock-a-doodle-doo. I'm going to put in parentheses in there, off-grid, so it'll be the desert off-grid chef. We're going to make decent, good recipes. It's not going to be off-grid weird stuff. Uh, anybody that's interested, just kind of keep that in mind. It'll be a couple weeks before it's up. The page is there now, but it's uh, the, 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 the desert chef. So, I have a lot of things that people don't ordinarily have. I keep cheesecloth here. But, if you don't have cheesecloth, an old pillowcase will do. You uh, Seriously, an old pillowcase, you just take and you're, you would... You want something in the shape of your press, which this pot of mine is about the shape of my press. And you just keep cutting these up until you've got a full pot. Now, for my press, I don't want to have more than what will fit in here anyway, because the, 
the press starts forcing the cheesecloth through the sides and it's a mess. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, I'm going to fill this up. The pot is full. Move the popcorn popper out of the way. The pot is full. Uh, but I did say something about the thorns. And I don't know if I was 100% on the thorns. The thorns are very unpleasant. They get in there and they tickle and they sting and you can feel them. And the only way you re that I can get them out, uh, really, is I got to get my tongue on it, find it, then I got to try to pull it out with my teeth. If I can't do it, I got to get tweezers. Um, no, that won't work. But what I can do is wait until I'm done and just tough it out. Soak my hands in hot, salty water or Epsom salt water. I don't think we have Epsom salt, so we're going to be, be salty water for me. And then you scrub them with a scrub brush, and that should get 90% of them out. It's unpleasant. Almost anything to, that you're going to do that reconnects you to your food supply is going to have an unpleasant aspect to it. We raise all our own chickens here. We raise the chickens for the eggs. That's fine. We also raise the chickens for the meat. Yes. And... If you're raising chickens for meat, there's something you have to do, and that's kill them and clean them. Unpleasant. There's an unpleasant aspect to almost everything you do that connects you to your natural foods. Um, but in addition to connecting you, it also um, makes you respect the food more and understand where it comes from and why, and hopefully be a better steward of the animals. So anyway... This unple and, and my hands are really bugging me at this, but it's okay. I'll go. I'll finish this job, and then we'll get them. Get rid of the thorns. You're gonna gather up the cheesecloth. Now, the reason you're gathering the cheesecloth, like so, I kept this tail here. I didn't cut it. I just <coughs> took one corner and made it, wrapped it around. Now, this will pull all out in one piece, like so, and it's gonna go in the press. So I've got to move the camera to set up and show you the press. So here's my press. Now, I'm going to get this and talk at the same time. That press is a Yakima, that's the, na the name of it. It's a Yakima fruit press. Yakima also makes cider, cider presses. And the only reason we don't have a cider press, there was a little juice I poured in. The reason we don't have a cider press is when I bought this, it was still at a time when we had very, very little money. And all we could afford was this. In retrospect, I would have bought the cider press, and it's a good investment, but I would have only gotten probably 20% more juice anyway out of these, out of a cider press. So, let me put this together. You saw me put the top in, right on top of my cheesecloth. I have to put the press together. Okay, the press is together and all set up. You'll notice it's a worm screw. The worm screw comes down and presses that uh, cap down and smashes this up and the difference between a cider press and a fruit press which is what this is is the cider press you can just yard that thing really really down there and get every last little drop out I meant to buy one last year when we had money which we don't now but last year I meant to buy one but every other year you get a lot of prickly pears and that last year was the off year so I never once thought about it so here I'm stuck with this and no money to buy the cider press so we make do now let me see what you can see. You can't really see all the way down, so let me start screwing this down. So I screw this down. Um, it takes a bit. Uh, of course, it's going to take a bit. Now I have juice coming out. And the juice is... The juice is running. I'm going to just tip this. The juice is coming out the hole there, and you can see it running down my little uh, improv piece of um, tin foil into a stainless steel pot. And I just do that till I think I have enough to put in a bottle, then I'll bottle it up. And I'll bottle it up, and I'll bottle it up different ways. I happen to have an empty liquor bottle here, so I put, put it in a li liquor bottle, and you want to be sure you name it, Pee Pee Juice. So it's named Pee Pee Juice, and you date it. If you leave it out like this, it will begin to ferment, and of course it'll blow up because I've got a good tight cap on it, so it's going in the refrigerator. You can also make a liqueur out of it. If you don't want to ferment it, you can make a liqueur out of it, and you know there's all kinds of recipes that you can do for that. Uh, but we're, what we do is I'll freeze a couple bottles of this and put the rest in Ziplocs, and we'll have them throughout the year. Now, I know what you're saying. It seems like a lot of work. And it is a hell of a lot of work, and you hate doing this work. 
There's me with, the, with my bad shoulders and back. This is extra hard for me. But you hate to do the work today. But tonight when I mix a drink with prickly pear juice, it won't be so bad. And in October, I won't even remember all this, but I'll still have prickly pear juice to mix in with uh, liquor, liquor uh, or whatever I want to do with it. Uh, I'm also going to cook with it today. I'm going to make a prickly pear um, a marinade, a prickly pear marinade, and we're going to marinate chicken breasts and cook them. So it's not only a liquor, it's not only a very healthful drink, uh, uh, something to mix with liquor, excuse me, or a healthy drink on its own, it also is a damn nice marinade. So that's, um, that is how you do it. And I'm going to keep going and hopefully I'll get this done and I'll finish the video when I've got a pot, um, almost a pot full. Now the thing is, you saw that that little pot I had was full and we put the uh, fruit in and pressed the fruit out. What we're getting here, I think it's very similar to grapes actually. That whole big pot of prickly pears, I'm only getting about, um, about a half a cup of good, sweet, pure prickly pear juice with no slime out of it. That's all there is. I'd get a little more if I had a cider press, but um, I can't. If I tighten this anymore, it will split the uh, cap on the inside, the cap that's pushing down. So that's it. I'll come back and finish the video once I'm done with that whole big bucket, which will take me a good two and a half. Well, as sometimes happens, the weather doesn't cooperate with us the way we'd like to see it. Um, but in this case, it was good. We had a 20% chance of rain today. Nobody expected any rain, and one cloud, but it was a monster cloud, came just drifting by and dropped an inch and five-eighths of rain on us, which filled my water tanks up. That was a good thing, but it kind of cut me off. I had to finish working on the prickly pear juice, so it's done. I had uh, what amounted to 12 gallons of fruits in those buckets, and this is the juice I got, which is roughly, let's call it a gallon and a half. Um, I homogenized it by putting it in the blender and running, uh, running it for a minute, and then I skimmed off all the foam. So we've got pure prickly pear juice here, ready to go, and I hope you learned a little something about how to do it. Um, learned that you can get some pretty decent stuff out of the desert, because this is tangy and tart and sweet at the same time. Um, and you can use it to marinate meats, you can use it to cook with, um, you can use it, like I said, to make wine or mix with alcohol, my favorite. Um, and use your imagination, but pure juice cost yeah. me nothing except about 150 pickers in my hands that I'm going to be dealing with for three or four days. But like I said, come October, I won't remember them, but I'll still have some juice left. So, until next time, folks, it's Robert Earl at the Eco Ranch. Bye for now.